Okay, so uh, in the lecture we were at the following point. We defined the general notion of dynamical systems. which have this mathematical structure. Namely, um, we say that a system is defined or uh, characterized by a set of variables, z of t, and at any given time the knowledge of the variables z of t completely fixes the state of the system and gives us the maximum amount of information that we can possibly have about the system at this particular instant of time. And uh, since we have observed in physics that physics is predictive into the past and into the future, that means that the knowledge of Z implies the knowledge of Z dot. And so we can write this in this sort of way. And this is the general mathematical definition of what is called dynamical systems. And if you want to know more about dynamical systems in general. Uh, this is a big deal in the lectures on chaos, which are also regularly offered here at uh, the university. So uh, this implements what we have said before. So clearly, if we know the, the time derivative, we can go in a predictable way into the future by adding a small infinitesimal positive time step, but we can also go into the past by adding a small negative time step. So it implements what we have said. And now let us again do some examples. Two examples, uh, let's say one example. Example one, let's say we have two variables, uh, set one, set two. Two variables, let us invent a law, set one dot is equal to minus z two. Z two dot is equal to plus z one. This is a law which is compatible with the general rule for dynamical systems. So we have here defined a very simple two-dimensional dynamical system. Who knows what this dynamical system actually is? Raise your hand, but don't say it. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, good. Let, um, let's extend the axis a little bit. Okay, so I see that uh, some of you have already drawn the right figure into the air. So let us in, uh, start with some phase base point here. Set one dot. Uh, set one is uh, big, and set two is zero. So if we start here at some instant of time, where do we go next? So what does the law tell us? It tells us first of all, set one dot is zero because set two is zero set two dot is positive. So we go here. Now if we are here, set uh, uh, one is still positive, uh, practically the same as before. So set two dot is still also positive, so we go up. But now set uh, two is not zero, but small, so we go a little bit to the left. So we go here, and so on. So we do this. And so you can guess it, and it's also a simple exercise to solve this set of differential equations. You end up with a circle. You end up with a circle. So we go in a circle, round and round. So these are our phase space points that we encounter if we uh, do the time evolution according to this particular system. What happened uh, if the time steps are equidistant, then all of these points have the same distance from each other. So it's really a circle uh, which we move along um, uh, with constant speed. And of course, this is the circle is a circle in phase space. The system itself might not be a circle, but this is a circle in phase space. What happens if we start here? How do we move? 
Of course, we also get a circle because that didn't depend on that exact location. But how quickly do we move in the circle? So if we go at the same time step, where do we end up? So uh, set one is bigger. So set two dot is bigger by the same factor. Therefore, we end up here at the same angle. We end up here and then we also end up at the same angle. So how much time does it take to go through the circle if we start out uh, at this point? It takes the same amount of time. So all the initial conditions uh, lead to some circular behaviors in phase space with the same periodicity. So what physical system are we describing here? The very familiar and extremely famous and beloved harmonic oscillator. It's the harmonic oscillator. So we could say, for example, Z1 is Q. Z1 is Q. Then we have here, or maybe Z1 is maybe P. Z1 is P. So we would have here P dot. And here uh, we have then P dot is minus Q. And here this law would tell us uh, Z1 is P and uh, that is Q dot. So it's a harmonic oscillator with mass and uh, frequency set to 1. So the law is simply P is equal to Q dot and P dot is equal to minus Q or Q double dot is equal to minus Q. So it's a harmonic oscillator with mass and frequency set to 1. So that is certainly a dynamical system and here we have immediately understood the phase space behavior. Now uh, let us modify the system a little bit. Let me start by the differential equation. Um, the second differential equation stays the same. Z2 dot is Z1. And here we do, what do we do? Let us do Z1 dot is not equal to minus Z2 but it's equal to minus Z1. So that's the only difference. We have here Z1 instead of Z2 and then we ask how does the phase space picture look like? Z1, Z2. Let's again start here. Z1 is non-zero and Z2 is zero. Where do we go next? Z1 is big and uh, Z2 is zero. So Z1 is big, uh, that means Z2 is positive. So we go up, but we also go left. So we go left by let's say 45 degree angle. So we go somehow here. So we go as much left as we go up. So it's a 45 degree angle with a certain uh, time step. Okay, let's, let's actually uh, let me draw it like this. So we start here and after one time step we happen to go just halfway. That is a big time step. So we go immediately here, so that our coordinate is uh, divided by 2. Then it's easier to see what happens. So next time step, the next time step, now our uh, Z1 is exactly half as large as before. And uh, Z2 has the same magnitude, so where do we go next? So Z1 is half as large as before. So Z2 is again positive, but half as large as before, and Z1 dot is again 45 degree angle. So we again reduce our coordinate by one half. So we go here. Right. Next step, again, uh, it's just all divided by 2. The velocities are divided by 2, and we go again in a 45 degree angle. So we end up here, and again, our coordinate is just divided by 2, and so it goes on. After the next same time step, we end up here, then we end up here, and so on. So we do this uh, Zeno's paradox. What happens if we start here? 
at some other point, maybe let's say just uh, double the distance from from that axis. So that one is twice as large as it was before. So what happens then? So here now our velocity is just twice as large. Therefore in our uh, unit time step we move twice as uh, fast um, as we moved here with the previous step. Twice as fast means that our arrow is twice as long. If we do twice as much of this arrow, where do we end up? I think we end up um, exactly um, such that, how is it? This arrow parallel transported to here and then do it once again. So, uh, please tell me when I've drawn it correctly. Above the point and on the same height as the limit of the Here. Right, it should be here. The same height as the limit, exactly. Very good. So we end up here after one unit time step. And after the next unit time step, we somehow end up exactly above that point. And so on. So it goes on. And then we again do Zeno's paradox. And uh, ultimately, after infinitely many time steps, we approach uh, this axis here. Okay, so this is uh, the movement in uh, that system. So it's also a perfectly well-defined dynamical system according to the general definition. And now there is a difference between the two uh, systems, a qualitative difference. And the difference means that this is something that we can have in physics as a fundamental system, whereas the right one uh, we cannot have um, as a fundamental system in physics. Because what happens here really is, um, let's say, let's give some interpretation again. What would be the interpretation here? So let's say Z1 is again Q, or Z1 is P, whatever. What, what should we do? I don't know. What is the most general solution of this uh, system of equations? It would probably be Z1 is equal to some constant plus uh, an exponential function e to the minus t times a velocity, right? Isn't it? So if we now check it. Uh, hmm? Ah, the constant has to be zero, so Z1 is this, and then Z2 is a constant plus um, Z1. Ah, so Z2 is a constant times V times E to the minus T. So let's do this ansatz. Z2 is a constant plus some velocity times E to the minus T. Then uh, Z2 dot is minus V times E to the minus T. And that uh, is by definition equal to Z1. And then Z1 dot automatically satisfies Z1 dot is equal to minus Z1. So this is the correct uh, general solution. And we know it's the general solution because it's an equation for two variables first order. So we have two integration constants. We have it here. Therefore, this is clearly the most general solution. So it's a constant shift plus uh, some exponential damping and that corresponds to friction again of course so it's a velocity with um, damping so we have friction in this system and that cannot be fundamental so how can we see this uh, friction or not friction from the phase space behavior so we can see it by looking in the following way Let us look at how phase space points approach each other by time evolution. So if we, for example, look at this area here. This is an area in phase space. Let's say we have some initial conditions with an uncertainty or we simply consider the flow in phase space of some multitude of points situated in uh, this area. So we track all of those phase space points with all these initial conditions. Then what happens to this area? The area gets transported here, here, here and so on. So ultimately, for example, the area is here. And uh, even though I didn't draw it like this, uh, the area is the same. The area remains, of course, the same. 
under time evolution. That's clear because we are moving along the circle and all of those uh, points are equidistant from the next. So the uh, area in phase space or the phase space volume stays constant under time evolution. And what happens here with an area? If we look at uh, those phase space points here, for example, this would be the area contained by those phase space points and if we track how they evo evolve in time then uh, they do all these Zenon's paradox so this after some time goes here and uh, so on so it's not on the blackboard but anyway the area of course clearly has the property that it shrinks the area shrinks the phase space volume shrinks becomes smaller over time And that corresponds to this uh, frictional behavior. So we could say physically we have something like friction and more in general the phase space volume shrinks by time evolution. And we can also see it in an asymptotic way, namely asymptotically, uh, or first of all at finite times it's always possible to predict the past and the future as we have stressed yesterday. So at any finite time the dynamical laws of nature tell us what is the future and they of course also tell us what is the past by going backwards in time and solving the equation of motion. So we can do this for any finite time. However, what happens if we let time go to infinity? If time goes to infinity, the system approaches that axis, so at infinite time we end up here. We end up exactly on the axis and it doesn't matter where we started from. It doesn't matter whether our initial condition was here, or here, or here, or here. For all of those initial conditions, at infinite time, we end up exactly at this point. So at infinite time, we cannot predict the past anymore. We can still predict the future, but we cannot predict the past. And that is not the case here. So at infinite time, we will still always remain able to predict the past and the future. So at t going to infinity, the system approaches a limit and that means we can not predict the past. So and you might call this uh, phenomenon a loss of information. We have lost the information of the initial state. We have a final state, but the final state has become independent of the initial state, so we have lost the information where we started from. And so, loosely speaking, you can say in this system we lose information over time, whereas in that system we do not lose information over time. And now comes the important general observation in fundamental physics and uh, loosely speaking we can say there is no loss of information and the technical uh, meaning of this is for fundamental systems where we have sufficiently much control over the details, the volume in phase space remains constant. Over time. And therefore, we can conclude that for uh, the description of such systems, uh, this general formalism of dynamical systems is not enough. It is not restrictive enough. It contains systems that cannot appear in fundamental physics. Therefore, we have to narrow down to specific classes of dynamical systems which do not lose information in that sense. 
so we need special types of dynamical systems and what are those special types of dynamical systems which do not lose information and those are Hamiltonian systems. Hamiltonian systems where this function f is determined by a Hamiltonian and where the variables z are actually p's and q's those are the dynamical systems which have the property on the left. And so this brings us now to Hamiltonian dynamics. In Hamiltonian dynamics a state is described by two n variables. So the number of variables must be even and we can decompose the variables into q's and p's, qi of t and pi of t, where i runs from 1 to n. Uh, we have given a Hamiltonian h, which is a function of all the q's and p's. And in those uh, systems then the time evolution is given by the Hamiltonian equations which read qi dot of t is dh by dpi and pi dot of t is given by minus dh over dqi. These are the Hamiltonian equations of motion and you could now identify that with uh, the general formalism at the top. So you could also say the f's at the top are now given by certain derivatives of h. So some of the f's are given by dh divided by dpi and some of the f's are given by minus dh by dqi. And the relative minus of course guarantees that somehow the volume in phase space remains constant because if the volume shrinks in p direction then uh, it must increase in q direction or vice versa because the two uh, types of the f's are now not independent but they are dependent on each other. And so you could for example now show that uh, for that type of law you can uh, formulate the f's and this time derivative in terms of some derivatives of some h whereas here there exists no h from which you could take uh, this law by taking these derivatives. Such an h doesn't exist and so therefore this is not a Hamiltonian system whereas that is of course a Hamiltonian system. So and what I say, the Hamiltonian systems preserve information in that sense. This is guaranteed by the very important Liouville theorem. Which you have probably derived in classical mechanics, so I will just cite it here. And this is exactly the statement that the phase space volume is uh, constant under time evolution. So the phase space volume which is covered by a certain set of points, if you define a set of points and then you follow the time evolution flow of those points then the volume stays constant. And so that can of course still contain a variety of situations. So you could for example have here some volume in phase space with some individual phase space points. But we consider the entire volume, then after time evolution it might um, behave like that. So it uh, remains more or less its shape like over there. Uh, okay, let's be careful so that the volume remains constant. So it more or less retains its shape. Maybe it gets stretched in one direction and it shrinks in the other direction. Okay, 
but also some uh, more complicated things can happen that the shape is completely uh, uh, different so it could also develop into something like that or it could also develop into some octopus like structure okay. as long as the volume remains constant such a behavior is possible and this of course would be a chaotic behavior or it, uh, something like that can be a chaotic behavior where the phase space volume remains constant but the shape gets completely distorted and uh, somehow the tentacles of the octopus uh, go everywhere but the uh, uh, total volume of the tentacles of the octopus is still the same as this but somehow the tentacles are very dense and uh, they stretch everywhere so for example you could have a situation like in chaos where basically every point in phase space is uh, very close or maybe infinitesimally close to one of the tentacles of this octopus but still the volume remains constant so there is no contradiction between chaos and uh, the Liouville theorem but nevertheless um, um, for small time steps we can say that we have no loss of information but of course in chaos uh, information might also be defined in a different way and then you, you if you cause grain then certainly you use you, you lose information in a chaotic system but uh, in that sense of the strict phase space volume information is preserved and so that is the special feature of Hamiltonian systems and therefore um, the Hamiltonian systems and Hamiltonian equations Hamiltonians and P and Q variables they implement some extremely fundamental and general observations of fundamental physical systems namely they implement first of all the fact that we have predictivity into the past and the future as long as we uh, know enough details about our state and the phase space volume remains constant also these two ingredients are manifestly implemented in the Hamiltonian formalism and therefore if you want to describe physics in completely general terms where you know about those ingredients then the Hamiltonian formalism is the correct formalism to use and then with it you remain still completely general so let us write down these uh, final words the Hamiltonian formalism implements the idea of dynamical systems we can predict unambiguously the past and the future of course given sufficient details on the initial state but I don't write that down and it implements the Liouville theorem namely volume in phase space remains constant under time evolution okay and this should give you some insight into the Hamiltonian formalism why we use it and what is its main benefit and that you can then compare with other formalisms any questions can I tell you general the, the fundamental systems are all closed systems yes uh, yes yes for sure uh, we only deal with closed systems on which there are no external forces acting yes our systems are closed and of course I repeat once more uh, systems with friction are very interesting as well but we do not consider them either um, and uh, they would simply correspond to saying that there are unaccounted for degrees of freedom which uh, we have forgotten or we have which we have ignored in our description but fundamental systems must include all degrees of freedom which exist and once we do that um, we have those properties.
at least according to experience. It's not a logical necessity that nature would have to behave like that, but it does, as far as we know. Now, let us go to the second topic. Uh, maybe we should switch on the lights. It seems to be very dark. Good. So, our second topic is the Lagrangian formalism. And so, here we again start by asking what is physics? We already know in physics we need to isolate certain physical systems which we are interested in. And uh, in the Hamiltonian formalism we had a strong focus on time evolution and uh, that meant first of all we had to consider states which are fixed in time, state of a system at some instant of time and then we discussed the time evolution. And the state was the maximum information that we can possibly have about the system. Therefore, once we know it, we can predict the future or the past of the system. Now we have a little bit of a different point of view. We are of course still interested in states and time evolution, but we have the point of view that we look globally at the possible behaviors of the system. That means uh, in this language we look at the possible trajectories of the system or the possible paths. So let us focus on trajectories or paths is another word for the same thing the possible paths a system can take. Let us ask uh, what distinguishes allowed trajectories, time dependent uh, behaviors of the system from not allowed behaviors. So this gives us of course also knowledge on the dynamics of the system but in a slightly different way. So in the picture we might draw it like this. So now in the picture it is important to draw time as one axis and then we might ask, okay, here we have some variable Q and uh, this would be one uh, behavior of the system, one trajectory as a function of time the system behaves like that. Or if we start here the system might behave like this. But uh, it never happens that the system does this sort of thing or it never happens that the system does that sort of thing. So what signifies the allowed trajectories from the disallowed trajectories? First of all, we have to change our description a little bit in order to uh, deal with this question and uh, um, give the answer. Previously, we were focusing on states, instantaneous states which tell us everything and so you already know a state then means we know Q and P. But P somehow is uh, like the velocity, P is somehow equivalent to Q dot. And if you come from school, I think you uh, almost inevitably are surprised by, by this requirement that we should impose P as a variable 
because after all p can be calculated once we know q. But you know p cannot be calculated from q at one instant of time only. In order to calculate p you must know q for a certain interval in time. And then you can take the derivative q dot and then you know p. So that means if we are not only focusing on an instant of time but on an interval in time and we follow the whole trajectory of the system then it wouldn't be necessary to have p's as variables, it would be sufficient to have only q's as variables in our known language. So, but uh, generally speaking, uh, without knowing anything, we could say we have to know fewer variables than in the Hamiltonian system because we have time derivatives also at our disposal. So that brings us to a new concept. Instead of phase space, there is the term which is often used, configuration space. And, uh, I, uh, in mechanics books that would be the space of the queues. And I will in general define it here in the following way. So configuration space uh, consists of variables qi of t and they might or might not be the same queues as from the previous section uh, which are sufficient to describe the trajectories of the system. So a necessary condition on that would be that if we know q of t for all t then we can reconstruct all the q's and p's from before but that might not be sufficient but it's for sure necessary so if uh, in this way we define some variables whose knowledge is enough to reconstruct everything therefore uh, the knowledge of those q of t functions would in particular be sufficient to reconstruct the momentum variables from before so this is now our configuration space and then we can ask what are possible trajectories which are the possible trajectories qi of t and uh, to be specific we can impose a variable between t in the interval ta up to tb Okay, and uh, then we can give an answer, and the answer is all kind of in the picture. You see that if you impose some uh, start and end point of a trajectory, then uh, you ask what are the allowed trajectories, and there is some one or several allowed trajectories between those endpoints, and some other trajectories are not allowed, and so you kind of have a classification. Um, of the allowed ones and you can um, uh, write this as a mathematical function and that brings you to the principle of least action. That is the principle of least action. So for each allowed trajectory there is a certain functional of the trajectories q of t which is minimized by the allowed trajectories and all the disallowed trajectories do not minimize the action. So in order to find the correct action you could start from the allowed paths then define some function, fun some functional, which is minimized by all those variables, um, but not by the other ones. Okay, that is the principle of least action. So we have an action, and uh, often it is enough that the action, which is a functional of the path, so the action is an, um, a mapping which maps some path between TA and TB, it, so it maps a function Q of T to a number. Something like that is called a functional. But it's typically sufficient that the functional is local in time and then it can be written as an integral over a Lagrangian. So S is an integral from TA to TB 
over dt of a Lagrangian L, which then might depend on q of t and q dot of t and maybe something else, but typically not. And uh, we allowed paths minimize s, that means the variation ds equals zero. And if we write uh, the action in this way, and if there is no higher derivatives than the first derivative, then this is of course equivalent to the Euler-Lagrange equations of motion, namely zero is equal to d by dt of dl by dqi dot minus dl by qi. So then we have characterized the allowed trajectories by this principle of least action and the statement would be that for any physical system you can find such an action which is minimized by the allowed paths but not minimized by the non-allowed paths. And then we have an equation of motion which looks like this. So here we are at the end, much quicker than in the Hamiltonian case. So our lecture is almost over, but I can conclude also uh, with a small statement. The Lagrangian formalism implements also a few things. So let's just contrast this with the Hamiltonian case. So it would be a more global view, I would say. And the role of time and instantaneous states is less pronounced. Role of time is less pronounced. That is a good thing for relativity because in relativistic theories the role of time should not be special because time and space are unified into space-time and therefore a formalism which does not single out time is good. But in more generality, this principle of least action has a huge advantage and it implements something extremely important in a very beautiful way, namely symmetries. Symmetries are implemented uh, in this way that you simply say a symmetry is something that leaves the action invariant. So symmetries are implemented in a very direct and straightforward way and so if the action is invariant under some symmetry transformations the equation of motion might behave in a very complicated way and uh, transform non-trivially but you know that the system is symmetric and every uh, symmetry transformed solution will again be a solution because the action is invariant therefore it will, if it was minimized before the transformation it will remain minimized after the transformation so it stresses symmetries uh, so if s is invariant that implies that solutions of the equations of motion uh, are well, um, preserved under symmetry transformation. And I just give you one small remark, which I already mentioned. So the QI here might be different from the Qs and Ps in the Hamiltonian.
And you saw the example already in the exercise where the variable QB was a Lagrange multiplier which didn't appear anymore in the Hamiltonian formalism. Okay, good. I think then we can stop here and uh, we will go on a little bit more.